It was in my early 20s um, and funnily enough the first time I noticed it was when I couldn't hear the, the line out calls playing rugby and it was then I started to notice other things that I hadn't been able to hear and we got to the point where we stopped worrying about what had caused this they couldn't find out they did hundreds and hundreds of tests they had 42 blood tests in one day and the only thing they found out was I'm allergic to kiwi fruit as the hearing loss deteriorated, when we used to go out a lot, we used to go out to nightclubs when we were younger and pubs. And even though it was tricky, um, we managed and it wasn't too bad. But as it got worse, um... sorry. Yeah, we stopped going out. He just would rather stay at home and, and read and be with the children, which is great, obviously, for the kids. But, you know, it had a big impact on on us and our ability to socialise with friends and so on. It was very difficult, particularly with the kids, because when children are small, they tend to have high-pitched voices and, and the high-frequency losses were the, the ones that were worst affected. So I literally couldn't hear what they were saying to me. I know Sadie must have found it really frustrating as well, and I know the kids did. The kids would be trying to speak to me and I couldn't hear them. I couldn't understand what they were saying. When we were in the car beforehand, he would basically, he would be, he wouldn't really be linked, really. He would kind of, if we were going to talk to him, we'd have to say it to Mum, who would then have to talk to him separately, because she was sat next to him. But if we were in the car and we were sat behind him, and it was just him and us, we never used to be able to talk. We'd, go, we'd drive down to Cornwall or something like that, and it was almost like I was in a cocoon. So I've got five and a half hours driving without any distractions, without anybody speaking to me. It's quite boring, to be honest with you. So after the implant, the first time I think I really noticed it, a massive difference was when the, one of the kids in the car said something to me, asked me a question, and Tom answered it before I answered it. And I was sort of, gosh, he's answered that question. He heard that question. Before you know it, it's, you, you forget what your life, how your life used to be, I think, you know, he, he, he sometimes has to pinch himself and remember how, when you're in situations, and it's like, well, I couldn't have done this before my implant, I couldn't have heard this, I couldn't have sat in, in, in this environment and be able to interact with these people. And it's been absolutely life-changing, to be honest with you. Um, it's just 100% better. Absolutely. You, you sit here in the window open and listening to the birds and things like that, and that was something that I'd just totally forgotten about and the, the unexpected noises that you find anywhere. Oh, when did lifts start to make noises? When you press the button and they go ping like that and, and they tell you what floor you're on. And it's, it's like, it's, it's almost like being a child again, like this voyage of discovery, all these things that I'd forgotten or actually didn't exist 20 odd years ago. And it's exciting, it's good fun. When I take this off at night, I can't hear anything now, but I really don't know it's there apart from the fact that I can hear. I was asked to trial the Rondo 2 in the middle of this year. I'd been watching, keeping up with the tech, talking to my audiologist, I knew it was coming. And it was brilliant being asked to trial it, and they switched it over, and it was really easy. They just, they've got the existing map on the systems, and they just pinged it in, popped it on. The first thing I noticed is it's much lighter. And I think looking at the figures, it's ridiculously something like only four grams lighter, but it's about 25% really, and it does make an enormous difference. And it's massively liberating not constantly to have to think, have I got some spare batteries? Have I got some? Because just stick it on a pad overnight, just like a, a, a smart watch or something like that, or, or the latest mobile phones. You don't have to plug it into anything. You just sit there and leave it. And the next morning, there's only got one button, press the button and off you go, ready for the day. As far as work was concerned, as I say, big law firms, some of them like to make out that they're very, very good at disability awareness. I don't think they had any inkling at all of what it's like to be as deaf as I was. And, and my consultants have always said, they've always had very good diction and they never understood why I could speak so clearly. It, it wasn't as good as it is now. But I think that almost worked against me because people didn't realise that I was deaf because, to use a phrase, I didn't speak like a deaf person might be expected to. So people just naturally assume that you're stupid, which is absolutely soul-destroying, to be honest with you. 
He uses Skype now for work and that just works brilliantly. Well, that's, that's just been transformative for his work, that he is now independent. He's been able to set up his own business. He can communicate with clients without difficulty. I started coaching rugby now. Um, I did try that when Hal started in the under fives, which is before I had my implants, so that would be about seven years ago. And I, think I just couldn't, I couldn't do it because I couldn't hear the kids, I couldn't hear the other coaches, and it was just, an, it was so stressful, it was a nightmare. I just gave it up again, and I dropped back out of that. Then when Betty started playing rugby, I just had the operation. So once I'd recovered from the op, I got involved with coaching Betty's team. Ended up managing that for four years. I do a bit of commercial work with the club now, trying to raise sponsorship and things like that. Uh, I've got a role as a non-exec director at UK Deaf Sport. These are things that, the, because the flexibility of my job, gives me the ability to do things like that. And it's great just to be able to do things for, for people who, who aren't as fortunate as me, basically. Uh, Tom and I have coached from under five to under eight. Um, before he had his cochlear implant, obviously it's quite noisy on a pitch in the morning, especially with a load of kids running around. Pretty hard to communicate, to make sure you're facing him all the time sort of thing. Uh, and if the kids were shouting at him, he really didn't pick up a lot of it. Um, it's pretty cold in the morning, so we'd have woolly hats on, which probably didn't help either. But since he's had his uh, implant put in, it was a lot easier to communicate with him. Uh, a lot easier on the pitch. He could hear the whistle, so he knew when we'd stopped, which is always good. And I think in the social sort of context, it was better as well. Right, what we're going to do today is I want to teach you something that's really, really, really important. If you learn only one thing today, make sure it's this. So the idea is you pass the ball as quick as you can. Yeah, look, I mean, I just think, you know, since he's had the implant, clearly, um, you know, his already sociable uh, nature has is, is, is even kind of probably gone, gone further. So his real true nature is to the fore and, you know, he's, he's always the life and soul of any kind of party, garden parties when there's obviously external noise, etc, etc. But he's very much to the, to the heart of everything that we're doing, which is great. Before he had his implant, we couldn't really go to the pub and have a beer and talk about what we wanted the kids to be doing, which is obviously a key part of being a, a coach of young kids rugby. Um, but since then he's been more confident in coming out in those social situations because he can hear better, he can hear what we're talking about and it's uh, I think made a big improvement to his coaching ability and never mind his, uh, his everyday life. Well, uh, about six years ago when I first met Tom, it was quite difficult. You had to be literally in eye contact, face to face and if you're on the side, he couldn't hear you at all. But then in the last um, six, six months, back in rugby season, if you're on the, behind Tom and said to him, Tom, how are you? He'd be like, oh, morning, Pete, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. He'd, he'd hear you straight away. Massive difference, absolutely brilliant. Revelation is uh, a changed man, as they say. Hey, keep going. Good running. My own view is that I'm not an enormous fan of invisible technology, because I think it helps that people do know that I'm deaf. If people have got no visual clue that you have a cochlear implant, then uh, I'm not really in favour of that. So I like it to be there and I like it to be visible. And I know people like to really jazz them up and put the bright colours on it. And I think that's brilliant to have the confidence to do that. I haven't, quite honestly. But I'm quite happy with it that people can just see it, but it doesn't scream, I've got a cochlear implant. But it, it does help people to understand that I can't hear as well as them, even though I can hear much better than I used to be able to. It's still getting better. That's the thing you see, even four years on, it's improving all the time. It's a massive, massive advantage when you've got three noisy kids as well, you just turn it off. I wouldn't, people are talking about these implantable devices that are gonna be on all the time. I know, well, well, thank you. No, 24 hours a day would just be too much for me. It's a big step. It's been hugely positive for me. It's difficult for me to say go for it because I don't know anybody else's situation, but I certainly explore it, look into it, find out what the options are. And if your journey is anything as exciting as mine has been, then it will definitely be worth it. <laughs>